morning, everyone, and good evening, everyone. So um, hello and thank you for joining us today at our um, event, our webinar event, Building Bridges, uh, Fostering Healthier Relationships Between Supervisors and Postgraduate Candidates. Uh, my name is Dr. Emily Yap. I am a research fellow at the University of Wollongong. I am also the chair of the Women's Research Engineers Network. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we start today. So you'll notice that, um, you know, we haven't quite live streamed on YouTube too often. Most of the time we're on Zoom. So we're testing out a few things, um, but feel free to use the chat to uh, introduce yourself, where you're from, um, and don't, for, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions as well. Um, other than being live streamed on YouTube, we are, the event is actually being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel as well, which you're already on. Um, and of course, uh, as usual, if you've been attending some of our past events, we always have our post event survey. So um, this survey, if you can just provide us with a little bit of feedback to see how you think we went, how do you think I went, <laughs> that would be excellent as well. All right. So let's just get into a little bit of the structure for today. So I just wanted to start off with an acknowledgement of country followed by a keynote talk by uh, Dr. Samantha Pereira. Um, and then from there, we'll go into a bit of a panel discussion, um, a little bit of a, res a response to uh, Dr. Samantha's uh, presentation, um, but also just giving a bit of context on um, what a PhD candidature or postgraduate uh, studies is like in uh, Australia and Brazil. And we've got four lovely um, and amazing uh, guest speakers here today as well. So we've got a mix of Australian and um, Brazilian uh, uh, experts and students on, on board with us. Of course, we've got a QA. and a um, So if you can pop your questions in early, um, that would be good. Um, and we did have some questions during our Eventbrite re registration as well. So thank you to those who uh, popped in your questions and and of course closing some closing remarks. All right, so just a little bit of an ex explanation of the acknowledgement of country. Um, it's a practice in Australia to respect and recognize the ongoing relationship of the traditional custodians and their land. And today I'm uh, speaking to you, presenting to you from the Darawal country uh, in Wollongong. And the University of Wollongong is committed to reconciliation and to inspiring a better future through education, research, and partnerships. So we've got a short video just to um, do the acknowledgement of country. Thank you. that country for Aboriginal peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. The University of Wollongong spreads across many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by their sacred landscape, an intimate relationship with that landscape since creation. From Sydney, to the Southern Highlands, to the South Coast, fresh water, to bitter water, to salt, from city, to urban, to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of the Aboriginal peoples of this place and space that has kept alive the relationships between all living things. The University acknowledges the devastating impact of colonisation on our campus's footprint commit ourselves to truth-telling, healing and education. All 
All right, so let's get into the first talk of today. Uh, we've got Dr. Samantha Pereira. Uh, so I'll just give a short introduction. She is a postdoctoral fellow in the graduate program in Development Technologies and Society at the Federal University of Itajuba, or short for UNIFE. Um, she has a PhD in administration from the Federal University of La Raz, UFLA, where she developed a thesis entitled Walking, There is No Path, You Make Your Way by Walking, Narratives of Researchers in Organizational Studies about the Sensitive Experience of Research. She is a member of the Logistics, Transportation and Sustainability Research Group at UNIFE and the Transdisciplinary Studies Laboratory at UFLA. Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite a todos que vão assistir essa apresentação. O meu nome é Samanta, eu sou pesquisadora no Brasil e a convite da Flávia Tuani em nossas conversas no grupo de pesquisa que a gente atualmente faz parte, o Log Trans, eu vim aqui falar um pouquinho para vocês sobre a minha tese de doutorado que eu defendi no ano passado. E ela vai ser muito mais uma provocação para que, e uma reflexão para que vocês possam abordar o que eu vou trazer aqui é, a partir da experiência de vocês. Então, eu agradeço o Rain, na figura da Flávia, pela confiança e pela oportunidade da gente poder conversar sobre esse tema. Essa sou eu, Samanta. Eu não gosto muito de aparecer mas para que a gente né, tenha alguma conexão de vocês saberem quem eu sou, eu coloquei uma das raras fotinhas que eu tenho. Eu sou formada em administração e o meu doutorado também em administração, mas essas não, dentro da temática do que a gente chama de mainstream, não é o meu campo de pesquisa, é, eu trabalho mais com a linha crítica, né, um campo que no Brasil se chama estudos organizacionais, e atualmente eu estou fazendo pós-doutorado no PPG Detex, na Unifei, que foi o programa também no qual eu concluí o meu mestrado. O que a gente vai discutir aqui é uma pequena parte do que eu tratei na minha tese de doutorado, que eu intitulei Caminhante não há caminho, você faz caminho eu andar, narrativas de pesquisadores dos estudos organizacionais sobre a experiência sensível de pesquisa. E aí, para construir o conceito de experiência sensível de pesquisa, a gente se baseou no conceito de experiência e anti-experiência do Jorge La Rosa Bom Dia, de condição sensível da Claudine Aroche, e debatemos na minha tese e nessa publicação aí, este conceito. E aí, por que, que eu quis trazer as questões teóricas? Para a gente perceber que não se trata apenas de senso comum, né, de meros relatos, mas existe uma construção mesmo, uma base teórica para fortalecer aquilo que as narrativas dos pesquisadores apresentaram para a gente. Então, a primeira categoria que eu vou tratar aqui com vocês é a categoria que eu chamei na minha tese de anti-experiências de pesquisa na pós-graduação. Essa talvez seja a categoria mais difícil de abordar e o tema mais espinhoso da minha tese, porque vai provocar muita gente, vai tirar a gente do lugar e vai trazer responsabilidade para a gente pensar em como é que a gente pode fazer diferente disso. Dentro dessa categoria, há muitos subtemas e eu queria começar falando com vocês sobre a questão do produtivismo, da publicação. Então, eu vou pegar a fala aqui da Bibiana, onde ela diz A publicação é fruto de um trabalho em que o objetivo é o trabalho. E a publicação é um desdobramento daquilo que é maior, e não a publicação pela publicação. Porque o que me assustava no doutorado é, você faz uma disciplina, você teve contato com aquela bibliografia naquela disciplina, aí você é obrigado a pensar no artigo. O objetivo das pessoas no programa era isso, era a conversa, era o assunto. E aí essa publicação eu acho um excesso. Um trabalho honesto que você se dedicou, é justo e importante que haja divulgação. Mas não isso que virou, porque daí não serve para divulgar a ciência, não serve para contribuir com a ciência, serve para encher currículo. E é muito perigoso que a gente continue reproduzindo esse modus operandi da pós-graduação, e eu vou falar especificamente do Brasil. A gente não pode deixar que a gente transforme a ciência numa mercadoria. Ciência não é um produto onde a gente põe numa esteira e no final sai um artigo. Ciência é o resultado de pesquisa séria em que a gente precisa pensar na transformação da sociedade. 
E de maneira nenhuma eu quero ser hipócrita, porque eu entendo que, pelo menos aqui no Brasil, a publicação ela é a moeda de troca, é ela que vai levar a gente né, para o doutorado, para quem está no mestrado, para um concurso público, para outras oportunidades, mas a gente precisa ser muito honesto em que parte desse jogo a gente vai fazer. Eu me deparei ontem com uma publicação onde as pessoas estão convidando outras pessoas para escrever artigo para publicar. Pesquisas que as pessoas nem sabem direito do que está sendo, né, tá sendo falado, do que está sendo discutido. Então, é perigoso e a gente precisa pensar muito sobre isso. Eu teria muito para falar sobre isso aqui com vocês, mas deixo aqui a provocação, porque eu acho que tem outras temáticas que eu quero trazer para a gente debater. Uma segunda temática dentro das minhas experiências que eu queria trazer é sobre a experiência em sala de aula, a hostilidade do ambiente de sala de aula na pós-graduação. E aí o Servó diz... Passei por uma disciplina bem tensa, com uma professora que se apegava nos mínimos detalhes das palavras que usávamos e até nos mandava calar a boca se a argumentação não estivesse agradando. E apesar de eu ter entrevistado pesquisadores de um campo específico dentro da administração, a gente sabe que essa hostilidade, infelizmente, não é exclusiva de uma área ou de um campo de pesquisa. É, o clima dentro de sala de aula não é favorável à dúvida, e a dúvida é algo inerente à ciência. Se a gente já soubesse tudo, não precisava ter dúvida, não, não se produziria nova ciência, né? novo conhecimento. Então, precisamos pensar muito em como a gente contrapõe esse ambiente de hostilidade que tem sido muito frequente na pós-graduação, pelo menos na experiência brasileira. E para encerrar as anti-experiências, apesar dos mu muitos relatos que eu tive, eu trouxe a fala da Carmelita, que passou por uma experiência muito violenta de orientação, é, e eu separei esse trecho. Ela disse, eu acredito que o despreparo da orientação no aspecto empatia no doutorado, ele pesa muito mais que o próprio conteúdo. Para você ter uma ideia do meu nível de estresse, quando acabou a minha defesa, que deram o veredito final, eu agradeci a banca, mas eu não comemorei. O desgaste foi tão grande que perdeu o sentido. Não tem mais sentido para mim. Perdeu a essência, perdeu a doçura. A violência que a Carmelita sofreu, o abandono, né, fez com que ela só quisesse encerrar, ela não conseguisse nem celebrar aquela conquista. E o que ela está dizendo aqui é que ela precisava menos de uma orientação técnica né, ou conteudista e muito mais do apoio afetivo e emocional naquele momento para ela finalizar. Enfim ela perdeu a doçura dessa experiência. E eu queria trazer um adicional sobre a questão das relações de orientação. Há muita pouca produção em torno dessa temática, mas o pouco que se tem sobre isso diz que a orientação é a mais complexa e delicada relação a ser administrada num programa de pós-graduação estrito senso e há uma diferença de expectativa nessa relação. Orientadoras e orientadores tendem a valorizar mais as habilidades técnicas dos orientandos. Em contrapartida, orientandos e orientandos demandam relações mais afetivas e pessoais da parte da orientação. E veja que a Carmelita, mesmo sem conhecer né, a teoria por trás disso, foi isso que ela relatou na experiência dela, que ela precisava menos de uma orientação técnica e mais de um conforto. E aí vale lembrar que a Carmelita perdeu um bebê durante essa experiência e não foi acolhida nem na sua dor, nem na sua dificuldade com a escrita, o que era a obrigação do orientando. É, obviamente que existe também um contraponto, né, de, que eu não, não pesquisei, mas de relações OX também de orientando para orientador. Já vivi, vivenciei, não vivi, mas vivenciei a experiência de outros colegas onde orientandos também foram muito desrespeitosos né, com é, a figura do orientador, dificuldade de escutar as críticas, acho que isso também é um, um ponto a ser abordado. Mas a gente sabe que nessa relação existe uma hierarquia, né, existe uma relação de poder, e as, os relatos de violência são muito maiores da orientação, né, do orientador para o orientando, do que o inverso. Mas para que a gente não fique só dessa perspectiva de que só existem anti-experiências na pós-graduação, eu queria trazer alguns relatos que são importantes para a gente pensar que não é só desse jeito, pode ser feito de outra forma, tanto que já está sendo feito. Então, eu queria trazer primeiro o relato do Sutéria, onde ele vai falar sobre a orientação. Ele diz, 
Ela não foi uma orientadora controladora. Ela me deu essa oportunidade de errar, me deu estímulo para eu tentar. Então, mesmo com as deficiências que eu tinha ou que eu não entendia, o que eu pude fazer do meu jeito por causa disso. Ela foi me dando espaço para eu encontrar os meus espaços dentro do espaço que era o dela. E a gente teria muitas coisas para discutir aqui em cima desse trecho da narrativa do Sutério, mas eu queria focar no erro, quando ele fala da oportunidade de errar. Precisamos voltar a pensar na ciência também como uma possibilidade do erro, e não como um processo linear onde a gente começa sabendo o que a gente vai pesquisar e termina respondendo aquilo que a gente já sabia. Isso não é ciência, isso é apenas validação de método. A ciência também se faz na dúvida e nos erros que a gente tem nesse processo. O Tobias, que teve uma experiência muito sofrida, mas nesse sentido teve a sorte de ter um orientador que apoiou ele nesse processo, ele diz, o orientador que assumiu o meu processo, ele me guiou pelo braço, ele foi muito parceiro em todo o processo, ele foi me orientando, me mostrando, exemplificando, porque ele sabia das minhas limitações, então não é um beabá, é você prestar atenção nas peculiaridades de cada orientando e perceber, com esse aqui eu preciso de um tratamento mais pormenorizado. E o que eu quis trazer em especial com o que o Tobias falou, é porque não existe um modelo de orientação. Obviamente, o orientador tem a sua forma, mas as pessoas são diferentes. A gente pode ter um orientando onde ele tenha um pouco mais de autonomia e segurança, mas outros vêm com mais inseguranças. Como disse a Carmelita, a gente vem com dores e o processo do doutorado, do mestrado, ele pode é, intensificar essas dores, né, essas inseguranças. Então, não é um beabá. Para alguns, de repente, a gente pode deixar mais solto para que ele flua. Outros precisam de um braço, de um acompanhamento mais pormenorizado, porque as pessoas são diferentes, não é uma esteira de produção de pesquisador. Eu trouxe o trecho da Salu para mostrar que, apesar dos grupos de pesquisa, a gente está se relacionando com as pessoas em muitos espaços, também em espaços informais. Então, ela diz... Eu participava de um grupo de pesquisa que foi a possibilidade de não me sentir sozinha, porque a gente interagia o tempo inteiro. A gente tomava café num shopping próximo e cada um falava das suas dificuldades. E muitas vezes eram temas bem diferentes. Mas eu percebi que eu falando, eu mesma me ajudava. Você acredita que eu passei, inclusive, a gravar essas conversas? Porque foi quando eu percebi que eu tinha os melhores insights, quando eu falava com os colegas. Eles não eram da minha temática, mas estavam vivendo o processo de doutorado. Então, interagir com eles era fundamental. E muitas vezes essa interação não se refere especificamente ao nosso tema, porque quando a gente compartilha as dificuldades, a gente se sente menos fracassado. A gente vai entendendo que faz parte do processo. Veja que ela menciona que eram pessoas que estudavam temáticas diferentes. Então, não é uma contribuição é, técnica né, ou de orientação sobre o trabalho mas é o próprio fato de compartilhar e à medida que a gente vai falando, a gente vai, também vai entendendo os nossos equívocos e vai tendo outras ideias e vai percebendo como a gente está dominando e aquilo que falta para dominar do nosso trabalho. Então, e não só num grupo de pesquisa formalizado, mas em outros espaços também, no horário do café, no horário do almoço, no intervalo das aulas. E dentre as inúmeras experiências sensíveis de pesquisa, eu queria encerrar com as experiências de amizade. Então, a Bibiana relata. Uma amiga que me acolheu assim do nada. A gente se viu uma vez, nessa vez ela já me ofereceu para ficar na casa dela, ela nem era da minha turma. E aí era isso, desses momentos também de descanso, porque a minha relação era na minha cidade, com a minha família e meu filho. Então, era muito essa coisa da maternagem. Então, ir para lá, apesar das dificuldades, era também uma possibilidade de voltar a viver essas relações de amizade, de rir, de contar piada, de beber uma cerveja, de poder fazer isso. E eu acho que a gente precisa questionar a centralidade que a gente tem dado à tese durante os períodos de mestrado e doutorado, esquecendo que a produção da tese ela é uma parte da vida da gente, ela não é a única parte. E a gente tem abandonado nossas relações familiares e nossas relações de amizade e o nosso, os nossos períodos de descanso. Eu acho que a gente tem que pensar, inclusive na experiência de mestrado e doutorado, é que o tempo do descanso, o tempo do, da risada, faz parte também dessa experiência, né, que é única na vida. 
e que existem relações que a gente vai construir neste momento, que são relações que a gente vai carregar para a vida inteira, tanto do âmbito pessoal quanto do âmbito profissional. Então, acho que é importante trazer isso para a gente não se esquecer de que a gente também precisa de descanso, também precisa de lazer, também precisa de dar risada e que isso não torna a gente pesquisadores menos sérios. Bom, e eu acho que é importante a gente também apresentar alguns antídotos contra essas anti-experiências da pesquisa na pós-graduação. E uma delas é a gente tentar minimizar essa oposição entre docente e discente, ou entre orientando e orientador, como se a gente estivesse em disputa. É preciso estabelecer relações menos hierarquizadas e menos autocráticas. Eu acho que é importante a gente estimular um ambiente mais colaborativo e menos competitivo, o que me parece que a competição tem sido muito reforçada na pós-graduação aqui no Brasil. Eu acho que a gente precisa fortalecer os espaços de diálogo sobre a pós-graduação, a gente precisa falar sobre ela, né, sem acusações, mas tentando pensar num outro modus operandi para que a gente não reproduza as violências que estão acontecendo. E eu acho que a gente precisa estimular encontros para além dos espaços formais, por exemplo, que acontecem nos grupos de pesquisa, mas fortalecer esses laços de amizade. Para falar da experiência brasileira, é importante também que a gente garanta as condições materiais para desenvolver a pesquisa. Né? É difícil que um pesquisador também esteja bem se a bolsa não é suficiente para que ele se mantenha e mantenha a sua pesquisa. É, é importante que no âmbito do, orienta, do orientador é, haja um limite de orientações e do trabalho do docente no Brasil, é, porque além de orientador, ele também é professor, se ele quiser fazer extensão também é com ele, há um excesso de burocracia, então também é preciso pensar nisso. E uh, a gente acha que é importante fortalecer as políticas afirmativas dentro das universidades brasileiras, e acredito que ao redor do mundo, porque as políticas afirmativas mudam o perfil do discente e vão enfraquecer algumas estruturas conservadoras dentro da, das universidades. Eu não fiz essa pesquisa sozinha, eu tive o apoio técnico, emocional e afetivo da professora Flávia Naves, professora do PPGA da UFLA, a quem eu tive a sorte e o privilégio de ter como minha orientadora. Aqui eu apresento algumas referências sobre experiência sensível de pesquisa, que caso seja interesse pode ajudar a fortalecer as discussões e o debate. E também as duas referências usadas na apresentação que vão tratar da temática da orientação. Eu agradeço mais uma vez ao REN, a Flávia Tuani. Eu espero que o que a gente abordou aqui seja importante para as reflexões de vocês dentro das realidades e dos contextos próprios e que a gente possa pensar em boas práticas de pesquisa dentro da pós-graduação para que a gente consiga oferecer experiências mais prazerosas durante esse momento tão importante da vida dos Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Samantha, for your presentation. As you guys could tell, um, that was a recording um, she presented in uh, Portuguese, um, and we were fortunate to have her on, and, um, and we were able to provide a translation so that our audiences who uh, don't speak Portuguese can also listen in. Um, and now I wanted to move on and introduce our panelists for our discussion um, to sort of reflect on um, Samantha's uh, presentation. Um, so first off, I wanted to introduce to you guys uh, Professor Hongling Chen. Um, she is an accomplished educator, researcher, and thought leader with over a decade of leadership experience in roles, including the Deputy Dean of Graduate Research, which she currently holds, and Associate Dean of Research and Graduate. She has expertise in curriculum innovation and pedagogy, and led initiatives which have won her multiple accolades, including the Office of Learning and Teaching Citations Award and a Principal Fellowship of the UK Higher Education Academy. Professor Chen uh, has published extensively in high impact journals and secured over $2.36 million in competitive funding, including the ARC Discovery Link and Linkage Grants. Professor Chen has extensive experience in leading strategies and initiatives that provide quality, training, and experience for higher degree candidates and supervisors. She has supervised uh, 18 PhD candidates to completion. 
So just a quick note, in Australia, when we refer to postgraduate studies, um, we sometimes refer to the students as higher degree research students, and this can also include the, the master's uh, students as well. Um, so next up, we have Professor Marilia Arigo. Um, she is an assistant professor of the postgraduate program in higher education at the University Federal Fluminense. She is an associate researcher at the Center for Medicine, Psychoanalysis and Society Research at the Université Sorbonne Perit-Cité and visiting professor at the University of Costa Rica. Really testing my language skills there. <laughs> She's a member of the psychoanalytic circle of Rio de Janeiro, the Brazilian Sandor Ferenzi Research Group and the International Association of Critical Psychoanalysis. She coordinates the Alterity Psychoanalysis Education Research Group, where she conducts an outreach project that offers free psychoanalytic listening to the academic community. So next up, we have Gabriela Baraldo. Um, give me one moment. <laughs> she is a um, she has a master's and is currently a PhD student at the Latin American Integration Interunit Program at the University of Sao Paulo. She carries out research in the areas of the memory of the Brazilian and Argentine military dictatorships, communication and democracy. She has a degree in social communication from the Haida School of Advertising and Marketing. And she is also the Sao Paulo Vice Regional Director of the National Association of Postgraduate Students. Last but not least, we have another fellow Emily on board, Emily Keo. Um, Emily Keo coordinates the training and development team at the University of Wollongong's Graduate Research School. As a coordinator, her role is to develop training programs and professional development opportunities for higher degree researchers. She is also a PhD candidate investigating the role of facial expression recognition and social functioning and is aiming to submit within the next five months. It's been very exciting. And in her spare time, Emily signs up for ridiculously long ra running races because she thinks the free t-shirts are worth it. And I highly commend you to that. I'm not a long distance runner at all. So it's really amazing. So let's have the uh, panelists on board. Just give us a few moments. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's nice to have you on board. And thank you so much for joining us today. All right, so um, so I might just jump right in. Um, so I'm sort of broken up this panel discussion to sort of two parts. So the first part, so since we've got um, representatives from Brazil and representatives from Australia, I thought it'd be nice to give a bit of a contextual introduction to what it's like in, in Australia and Brazil. Um, and then from there, we'll dig in a bit more into uh, Samantha's keynote presentation and, and sort of what your thoughts are, um, what your experience or your fellow colleagues and students' experiences have been as well. So I hope that's all right. Um, so first off, um, I guess this is more towards uh, Hongling and Marilia. Um, what do you think is involved uh, when a student uh, undertakes their PhD or their higher degree research studies uh, and candidature. And what do you think is important about the role of the supervisor here? So either one of you want to go first? Okay, I, I, I can go. I can have a go to answer that very difficult question. Um, hi, everyone. It's morning here. I'm not sure what time zone you are in, uh, but it's such a privilege to be able to speak to you today and really share some my experience and, uh, and possibly some uh, the, the, the insights that I have again as a supervisor and as a leader in the graduate research training. So what is involved when... Um, when the students enrolled in PhD, I think it's very it's 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 a quite a challenging undertaking for us for students. Um, in Australia, we got students from all come from various ex background experience. We have students graduating from an undergraduate degree, haven't done an honors degree. An honors degree could be embedded within the undergraduate or could be in addition to the undergraduate degrees. So they will do one year of research degree and 
um, being trained as a re researcher, apprentice re researcher, and moving into our uh, graduate research program. And we could have somebody who have worked in the industry in their job for about 10 or 15 years and wanting to come back to read, to, 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 to update their knowledge, to become a re researcher. And we have students coming from a different country wanting to do the study here. So we got people from different backgrounds, people from different experiences enrolled in the, in the high degree research. So it's a challenging for super supervisor to be adopt, adapt their, their, their approach to really to, uh, to address their needs and their needs um, to support them. So doing a PhD, and it's such a, uh, it's, it's, it's a challenging process because you've got to know your discipline knowledge. You've got to craft, define your, your, your research skills and then being able to communicate your findings and being, being, I have to become a more re resilient um, along the way because it's, it's not an easy job. It's not an easy job. If it's easy, I think we'll have everybody become a PhD, uh, a, a PhD scholar. So I think the role of a supervisor is being able to mentor the students, being able to the, the leader of the field, leader of the discipline, and being able to guide them in their process. And, and I think the supervisor is also um, a friend, but not too personal friend, but being able to support them, it's a very supportive um, person, and being able to encourage them uh, to, to um, uh, when uh, to encourage to get over overcome the d personal professional challenges, and I and also think the supervisor is somebody who is a cheerleader, being able to help them to celebrate their 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 successes and uh, and and help them to see the future. I think mo the most most satisfying part of my role as a supervisor is being able to um, help my students feel confident and see hope when they walk out of my room. And that's the part that I found most satisfying. I think I can go on for about one hour and two hours, but I'll let Ma Marina to share her insights. All right. Uh, good morning, good, uh, good evening for everybody. Well, I think uh, when a candidate under takes a postdoctoral or a doctoral uh, place, uh, uh, start a, th a thesis, several things are in, uh, the, uh, in, in play. And I think we should pay a, a little more attention, more attention for that, uh, the, the kind of things that we don't see that are not written, not talking not, uh, for uh, the supervisor. For example, uh, it's not only to make a research, it's not only to do a, a thesis, uh, it's a job, first of all. And behind this, uh, uh, so we, we have uh, a vocation, possibility, a talent, a dom that uh, uh, people can uh, realize there if they have all the, the stuff, all the infrastructure to develop your thesis. But the job. So sometimes, most of the times, people need this job. But behind that, there are the, the desires, the projections, fantasy, fantasies. So a kind of a, a lot of uh, in unconscious uh, motivations to be there. So for uh, a supervisor, uh, we have to, we are the part that we have passed already all this way. I don't think like Samantha that uh, Doctor to do a doctor has has to be a moment of pleasure. We we ha, we have to find pleasure other uh, in another place sometimes. Uh, but just I feel we don't have a lot of time. We have, all our time is that 
should be dedicated to the research. So everybody knows there that. And so people getting a, 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 a PhD, not only to job or to do a research, but to be recognized from the other. Okay. So this, um, I don't know, Feishi, if you, the Brazilian can help me, uh, this quantity of motivations, this unconscious motivations may make things more difficult. So I agree completely with uh, Dr. Chen uh, about friendship. We, I don't think we can be friend of uh, exactly good friends, intimate friends. It can happen when we have uh, a lot of affinity to, to someone, to some student. But I think we have to, to make some distance. This is very different in Brazil and in France, for example, where I did my a part of my PhD. Uh, and there, in France, in France, I did not have any kind of friendship with my director. This is a difference out there. They they say director here in Brazil is guide. It's a guide in supervisor in Australia. So this this changes everything in the relation. So my director never was my was never my friend at the time I was doing my research. But one day after I, I got my doctor uh, degree, she starts to, to ask me to, to, to dinner with her. So <laughs> even in, in her house, we, we got a, a, a good friendship. We have a, a good relation until there. But I think because uh, we have a problem nowadays we are mixing, we are uh, uh, making a lot of mistakes in between the private place and a public place. The place that we work, the, the place that we live, that we get our, our friends. For sure, Samantha is, is right, we have to, uh, it's, it's good to to prof to make friends to exchange ideas and even to talk about our supervisors <laughs> <laughs> one thing that we most love to do when we are uh, 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 students researchers is to talk about our idols our uh, the people we project ourselves. So I think uh, this place is good, but sometimes it gets a bigger place than the research. It's more important for lots of people to be recognized, to be the first one, to be the 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 the, the, the star of the eyes of the supervisor then to do your research and sometimes it's more important the honor the di the diploma diploma di diploma yeah. diploma diploma so then to do the research so we have lots of problems there yeah i might just yeah put a pause there because it's sort of like getting to some of the questions i want to explore later on as well but it almost sounds like you know between between hongli and marilia it's like this fine balance between not a very close intimate friendship that you might have uh, with say you know childhood friends for example um but also not too far apart that in a professional setting there's no there's no sort of that um, I guess inter interpersonal connectivity there as well. Um, I might just go on to the to what the PhD uh, candidates that we have here on board uh, think. You know, what what was your impression when you when you uh, decided to take a PhD? And I guess what are your expectations of a supervisor there? <laughs> 
Emily or Gabriella? Yep, Emily. I'm happy to go first. Um, <clears throat> I apologize, my voice is a little croaky today, and I hope that doesn't bother anybody. Um, Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> I actually think it's a little bit ambiguous when you start a PhD. A lot of people don't know what to expect from their relationship with their supervisor. Um, I think there's a lot of people who go into the PhD or, or a master's by research um, relationship sort of maybe with really different expectations. And I think across all of the PhD candidates that I've spoken to, a lot of people have very different expectations of what their relationship with their supervisor is. And depending on what your expectations are, you might be really disappointed when you start doing your PhD and you find out that actually they're not necessarily there to, you know, counsel you or, you know, tell you excellent things about your work necessarily. They're there to help you achieve your goal. Um, and, and I think some people have a little bit of a, um, I guess, a different perspective of what that could be. So I think it's really important when you start a PhD to set up those expectations and work with your supervisor. And there's lots of tools that people can use to help identify what these expectations are. Um, in fact, if, if you want, we can send some, I can provide you some documents or some links to some documents where um, supervisors and students might want to sit down together and identify what those expectations are. Um, but I think that will certainly help um, keep the relationship um, from, I guess, becoming too frayed or sort of um, a bit too, I guess, contentious at times. Um, but it's certainly an interesting relationship and very complex relationship as well uh, between student and the supervisor. Very hard to navigate at times, especially when you're doing something like a PhD, which causes so much stress. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a probably not a straightforward answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emily. What about yourself, Gabriella? Uh, hey, everyone. Well, I guess for me, my I, my first experience doing my master's was terrible. I really had problems with my um, supervisor and I had to change supervisors. And that's something that um, I guess it's something that it's important to to spotlight that the difference maybe between doing your PhD or postgraduate grad in Australia than do it in Brazil. In Brazil, we are constantly facing multiple uh, struggles and multiple um, situations that maybe are something that is very unique, very exclusively to third world countries, you know. Uh, we have had a something that is actually very positive, which is a, a huge change in the face of the people who are in the in public universities in Brazil, which is where are, is the uh, the high quality knowledge, high quality education and research that we have here, uh, especially because of public politics that include black people, poor people inside of the universities. And that has in the last few years reflected in the post-graduation also. So we have more poor people and black people and indigenous people in post-graduation, even though it's still um, very underrepresented, it, it has been changing. And this also has been becoming a challenge in this relationship with the university and how the university is, is welcoming those people and giving them uh, the, the structure that they need to stay in the universities because we're talking about people that need help to get transportation to go to the university or they need help to eat when they have classes and that's a very, very um, uh, a reality that we have to address now inside of our universities. That was not something, there was not a problem a few years ago when our universities, they were mostly for the elites and they were mostly white. And therefore, this has also reflected in the relationship between supervisors. Uh, for one example I can give that I, I have seen frequently is that uh, especially me, I study in the University of Sao Paulo, which is 
the biggest, most important, well, and most and better ranked university of Latin America. But it's a very, very problematic university because it's not made to include people. So, for example, you can see um, supervisors demanding their students and their, to read or follow classes in French or even English. And in Brazil, people don't speak English because it's extremely, extremely, extremely expensive to learn English. It's something that only people who are rich can achieve. Or if you are really, really dedicated to, to that or you have a talent to learn a language, because, but people, which is also a problem because here you have to, uh, you have to take a test before entering the postgrad to show that you know either English, Spanish, or French, depending on the program. And this is already makes many relationships very hard. So us that we organize this, the postgrad students movements in Brazil, uh, we organize associations of postgrad students inside of universities. I organize also the National Association of Postgrad Students. Um, we talk about a lot about harassment. That's the kind of thing that get that came to us. People are always talking about here they are facing uh, harassment, but harassment in an institutional level or an academic level in which they don't have the freedom to really have a relationship with their guiders in, in which they understand this very, very uh, deep uh, inequality between the people who are inside the public universities in Brazil right now. So. Again, that's the challenge that we are facing in Brazil, which is how to prepare our universities and our supervisors to welcome these people and to make our universities more plural and more welcoming to everyone. Yeah, thanks for that, um, Gabriela and, and Emily as well. Uh, seems like, um, well, sorry to hear that you had a not so great experience during master's, but it sounds like yeah, it's quite different between Australia and Brazil in terms of, you know, how you welcome the students in, how do you set their expectations? There's some underlying conservative, you know, racial tones as well. Um, and this sort of leads into my next question quite nicely, because I wanted to talk about how, at least in Australia, um, most, if not all, from what I understand, is that we have something called the Graduate Research School, which Hongling and Emily work in and sort of wanted to touch on from, you know, what does it provide in for, you know, is it just for the students? Is it also for the supervisors? Um, and, you know, is it, is it something that uh, we can learn from each other between Australia and Brazil on how we sort of accommodate for, for, the, for the students? If Hongling or Emily, you want to sort of jump in there? Okay, um, I'll have a go. Yes, we do have a graduate research school. Um, the, our graduate research school was established in two, only in 2015. Uh, I think it was 2015 that we first established. Before that, we had a research office, um, a small student managed center. So the idea was we'll be providing the central support to and to make sure we have a coordinated, coordinated, a unified approach to all students within the university. Um, it's, it's, it's a blended model in the sense that we have a central support that Emily is coordinating those training uh, activities. And also we have a, a team of our uh, our, our graduate research school staff providing some services to to help the candidates with their the every aspects of their candidature, their enrollment, their 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 um, their um, scholarships, finances, and so Emily and I we work in the in the training and the development, providing opportunities for their professional development. Um, so as well as this centralized the support, we also have a faculty based support. Uh, we have a, there in each school, uh, there's a head of postgraduate studies that's overseeing the experiences of the students. And at the faculty level, we have social dean high degree research. So it's a centralized approach, but then supported, supplemented by the faculty based activities. Emily, do you want to add anything there? Uh, no, I 
I, I sort of see our graduate research school as, um, or I see the purpose of the graduate research school to help PhDR students or PhD and master's students to, to thrive, um, to not only get their PhDs, but to enable them to develop a whole heap of skills that will help them get jobs after their after their degrees are finished. So um, I, I think we're incredibly lucky and I think Australia has a really PhD focus um, perspective where, um, you know, we do provide a lot of support for our HDR candidates and um, as a HDR candidate as well, I do feel supported and I think Australia has a, I guess we're very lucky um, to be doing our candidature in Australia. So. Yeah, I, I, I can't really say too much more on top of Humblin, I think, Alda. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I was sort of thinking on the Brazil side, is there something similar to this? I mean, Gabriella, you sort of touched on it a little bit as well, but um, maybe Marilia, you might know a little bit more as, a, as an academic, um, seeing it on the other side compared to a student. Are there services similar to what the Graduate Research School sort of provides in Brazil? Yeah, uh, in our university, you know, our federal universities, we have lots of uh, kind of support since uh, uh, alimentation, um, uh, sejour, a place to live for people uh -huh. who needs, and uh, healthy support in our uh, university. Uh, hospitals, and also this, uh, um, uh, health, mental health support in several projects. Uh, a colleague of mine is studying all the projects to help problems for for students because we have a kind of uh, of epic of uh, 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 climbing of suicidals and anxiety and depression between students and we have lots of uh, of articles uh, um, saying that this is that's why uh, university provokes problems uh, uh, mental uh, in mental health provokes disturbs so but I don't think so I think this kind of study is trying to fix uh, 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 some uh, institu institutional culpability that doesn't exist at all. I think mm -hmm. in relationships, relationship between supervisor and the researcher, the candidate researcher, it's already difficult because it reproduces a kind of relationship between father and son, mother, daughter. So it's a kind of uh, a, a, a narcissistic relation that in so I think there are singularities as Samantha said, people are different, supervisors are different. So this kind of relationship is it's very uh, 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 in this kind of relationship. It's very common. We ha had conflicts and even impasses that makes everything difficult. So what we have, we have a kind of several projects that appeared for support for giving support for for students. I even I did a, a, a project, that my, this is a cat in a hot tin roof, the name of our project, for people in, 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 in kind of, kind of uh, suiciding or in, in just kind of terrible problems for students, mainly for students. It comes to students for post-graduation, post but it's very har rarely we have some someone who is there with this kind of problem because of their guider, their, 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 their supervisor, but it, 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 it happens. So we give, we have lots of possibilities in group and in some 
projects like mine, we offer uh, uh, listening, uh, 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 free listening. It's uh, we, we and we used to say that it's a kind of revival of the clinical public clinicals of Freud in the Red v Vienna in the uh, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century, when we have. Uh, 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 when it flourished, this kind of initiative. But what we have, what we are living now, we are living, I, and I will conclude, we are living in a moment that Samantha talked a little bit about that. That is a moment that competition, it's every, uh, each time uh, um, stronger competition, a kind of uh, mercantilization, mercantiliz mar merchandising. We are doing merchandising with, with our research. We are expecting from a, for a supervisor to be a kind of a hero and a bureaucratic. And so it's impossible. Things get worse in this, and people don't know where to find help. We have lots of possibilities to give in help, to help students, but uh, the problem, I think, is not exactly the relationship because this is ever have. Yeah, this is it's not a, a very difficult. We we live in a moment in a moment that the competition, the mixing, public and private. Uh, politics, problems, social problems. That's why people are starting to suicide, to commit suicide, to get depressed, depressive. And the expectation should be in the top of a, of a pyramid where your supervisor is. He's the model. He, you want to be like him, like her. But this is impossible because we have too much too many people to get yeah. in this it's only place so i think we have structural problems we yeah. have to, to the structural problems the relationship problems always always will be there and now for this we have to think about who is the supervisor who is uh, uh, the candidate how things could go better but not it's not a supervisor that would solve this problem. So another person, other bureaus in university or even in mental health. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that's that's an interesting thing because it sounds like um, there's this hierarchical structure um, very prevalent in in Brazil, especially when you have when you when the student does take on the PhD or the masters, um, and it seems that it's not as Emily pointed out, that expectation isn't set from the initial um, meeting or, um, you know, even before the, the student actually enrolls in, in, their, in their studies, right? Um, but it's almost like I, I have nothing against, you know, mental health um, clinics and all that, but it almost sounds like it's a bit of a reaction to this underlying existing um, challenges here rather than sort of trying to create something else that could be preventing um, these these cases. I mean, it's not not a good thing to have all these, um, the, these rates of suicides and depression going up. Um, and it, it almost sounds like the onus to solve those issues are set on other people other than the supervisor. Um, and do we think that, I mean, I've got so many questions in my head, um, you know, one would be, one would be how, you know, it only sounds like the academic should look to, should strive to continue um, improving their, their, their supervisory style, but, you know, um, how, how can they do that? And mm -hmm. another question that comes to mind is almost like, um, uh, 
actually let's go do that one before I sort of trail off. Um, yeah, it's, you know, when a supervisor, especially someone who's in a much uh, senior position has taken on so many students, they get into this rhythm, right? How do we get them to sort of almost break that rhythm and learn that, okay, you know, going into, I don't know whether it's like refresher training every couple of years to learn about, you know, there's what the, what the community of practice is like. I don't know if um, anyone, Marilia, Honglin, Emily, Gabriella, if you have anything to say to that. <laughs> I don't think it's a ca I don't think we have we we can solve problems training supervisors. Okay, it could be useful, but the problems are more uh, uh, are deeper. In the side of the person, the the interpersonal relationship, we have narcissism. Uh, necessity uh, of belonging, of being recognized, uh, projecting our expectations, our ide idealizations, and not, not, none of these kind of things we can pre prevent. Yes, that's right. We can say everybody can may do analysis, but this is not a, a solution. Everybody has to do analysis, so we are living in a, in a kind of a, a psycholo psychological society. Uh, uh, no. The other side, we have structural problems, structural racism. We have uh, no place for everybody. We have a hierarchy society where university reproduce this kind of pyramids so there is no place for everybody someone who has has to be the best has to be the best to do better things so we are produce, producing producing this kind of conflicts so i i think this is not a kind of mm. uh, uh, we cannot prevent but we can talk about that and we can be prevented for our own for our reactions for our words for sometimes mm. we are talking to someone in, mainly for the supervisors we have to be prevented for our way of communication communicating because the other part generally is the weaker part so we can traumatize only saying uh, a little uh, a small uh, foolish thing and for the other people who expecting to be recognized it would be a bomb it would be yeah. a bomb. yeah that's a challenging one i think gabriella or Holling, you wanted to say something yeah i believe also that i think i like to think how we can uh overcome this kind of situations i guess it's a problem that how as marilia has said uh they don't come exclusively from the post graduation they don't they are they don't they're not born inside the university they are not created by the post graduation but i guess post the university and the post graduation many times reinforce uh, some of the structural problems that we see and the academic pressure and this, and all the, as I was saying, all the inequalities that, we, the, that the students have to cope during their time in the university uh, certainly aggravate their health issues problems. And in, in my university, in the University of Sao Paulo, uh, the cases of suicide, they are very common and they are very uh, a huge deal for us and we have been discussing that and we have been um trying to come up with um tools that we can use to take care of our community and i guess the the best one we have we have found so far is definitely the the students organizations is when we come together and we exchange these kind of situations um I was definitely have a bad time in my master's until I found the, the postgraduate graduate students associations of my program. 
and and everyone welcomed me and they talked to me and they said the, exper the experiences you're facing they are normal um uh, people go through that you're not um you're not imposter <laughs> you should be here and they really i guess this 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 trying to build a community also between people is is, is, tr is really helpful and more than uh, building a community coming together as students uh, help us to come up with these ideas um, help us to face uh, the direction of the university and say this is the problems we're facing this is the situations we're having this is the, the issue they're, they're arriving to us as students representatives um, how can we do this and we uh, we try to to come up with work groups that we can do researches and and understand better what's going on inside our university. We try to um, create programs. Uh, right now, we, we are working towards creating a protocol to. Oh my God! I forgot the word in English. But to. Um, to come to come forward when there is a harassment uh, situation, yes. So uh, a protocol in which we protect the victim because we know that many times when there is someone is, is a victim of harassment in many cases in in type of a harassment, um, it's difficult because uh, also we have in this situation of uh, supervisor and student a, a, high, um, a situation of high hierarchy. Hi, Hierarchy. Yeah, hierarchy. Okay, thanks. And in which the student loses a little bit because maybe the, the supervisor is very important in his department and going to make your life very hard for um, you to publish a paper sometime or for you to uh, find a job inside an institution at some point. And then, so should you have a protocol in which you have uh, protection of the victims? And they mm. can, and you can have um, investigations that go to, uh, for it in a anonymous way. In a, uh, yes, it's, it's very helpful. And we have only achieved the solution by um, coming together with our students and talking it through, and understanding this was a real problem inside of the university that that affected our mental health, that that affected our work and our productivity. As, as researchers and scientists. Yeah, thanks for that. And that's it's really good to hear that there's this association to do all that too. And sort of wondering on the, I guess in Australia, um, are there, are there um, policies or some of these protocols in place to try and mitigate some of these challenges that in Brazil they face? Hmm. Um, definitely. And I can really appreciate those challenges Marila and Gabriela has mentioned, have mentioned. And, and I think it's, it's, it's a, um, it is a really um, challenging issue to navigate between those individual styles, those individual supervision styles and, and the kind of societal structure that we have put in place. Now, we are a bit, a bit fortunate in, in Australia where quality supervision is very much valued. And from, from TEXA, TEXA is our national uh, quality teaching standards. Um, there's a really clear requirement that, that each university has to provide a high quality experience for HDR candidates. Every university goes through five year um, accreditation so we are our university is going through accreditation at the moment we have to demonstrate what supervision training training opportunities we have provided for both our candidates and for us for our supervisors and so we are um, rolling out a, um, a a requirement where all supervisors will have to go through training and i agree with you marina training is not going to maybe address all of the problems but what we hope to do is to create expectations and to set standards what excellence looks like. 
Okay, and so gradually we want to be able to foster and nurture, uh, and, and nurture a culture of excellence, a, cu a culture of best practice. We, I, I don't think we'll be able to to um, to get rid of all of the bad behavior. I, I call those bad bad behavior. We have exactly the same thing happening. I think in, on the individual level, people who is a narcissist and who people who doesn't treat the students with respect and 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 so but some of the behavior is not not accepted at all um racism uh sexual harassment that's student where our university has a really strong stand on those issues those things will not be tolerated um at all once they are uh, they're they're they are, they are, they are, they are identified so we got strict policies and protocols as well to to handle those deal with those um, um issues our students are um the, the, well, our students are also um being have re received training they have a compulsory training on around those matters how they can cope with so it, on the one hand we give the students the tools to manage those issues and we educate our supervisors trying to to hope to create a culture of support and trust and respect for all, all, all our candidates emily do you have anything to add on top of that um, only that, and, and I can't speak for anybody outside of, of Australia, but most universities do have, um, I guess, a, a plan for students if they are experiencing difficulties with their supervisors um, or mentors. And if there are people who are watching right now and I can give you any sort of advice, it would be depending on the nature of the problem, try and sort it out early. Don't wait for things to develop into a problem that is no longer controllable. Um, so if you're seeing sort of red flags and you need to sort of perhaps communicate to your supervisor, um, this is how, like, this is what works for me. Uh, can you hear the birds? Do I need to close my window? I might just... Yeah, I've got a few birds as well, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs> oh, it's a bird fight going on outside my window. Um, you might even want to speak with your head of postgraduate study. So we have HPSs in at UOW, and I think most universities around Australia have some sort of um, uh, academic or, or um, staff member who who looks over the um, postgraduate research students. So they might be an option for people to speak to confidentially. Um, alternatively, at UOW, we've got a dean of graduate research, Professor Simon Moss, who um, who students are very welcome to go and speak to anonymously um, and sort of get a, get advice on what to do. It, it, it's such a complex issue and I wouldn't feel comfortable giving any sort of um, specific advice to students on what they should do. But speaking to somebody like the dean or the deputy dean or HPS who has seen lots of problems like this before would be a really good place to start. But try and get on to these things early. Don't wait for things to escalate or don't wait until you're at the end of your candidature and you can't continue on with your with your degree um that that's it happens if we can avoid it try to avoid it thanks emily and that's a really wonderful tip as well and i love how um in the in the comments that um a lot of you are also agreeing that you know um you could like having you know things like the training um, won't, won't necessarily solve everything, but it's a start, it's a beginning to really improve the relationship between those supervisors and and um, and the students as well. And just get the conversation going that um, like one method doesn't fit all, you know, everyone has different challenges. Um, and at least for them, for the supervisor themselves to also reflect that, you know, maybe there's a bit of that unconscious bias that, that maybe they haven't realized as well. Um, and I'll move to a couple of questions. So I'll start off with, um, th there were a few questions that we got during the registration and I tried to combine them all together. Uh, it's a little bit tricky, um, but they were quite specific in this case. Um, so maybe one of them I could ask is, you know, a lot of questions were, how can we advise students about scheduling or developing plans or or 
encouraging and motivating students who aren't as proactive and needs a bit more of a push without adding that level of added stress. Um, and, and, you know, Emily and Gabriella, you can sort of think about how you would receive, how, how you've received some of that advice before as well. So maybe Honglin and Marilia to start off with. <laughs> okay, um, I could have a go. I think as a supervisor, I I'm always need to think of ahead of the students. I I think for supervisors, we should be knowing where are the key milestones they should be achieving, but then um, encouraging the students to plan ahead. So I often ask my students to sense their timelines. That we call that a Gantt chart. Okay, so it's it's a timetable you can create, and I like to see the key milestones for the next month, for the next two months, next three months. I ask that gently. I say, well, let's work on this. And so that becomes a responsibility of me as well as my students. And so always not telling them what to do, but say, we should do this together. Okay, I invite the students to do it with me, so that becomes a joint responsibility. And I think this is very important because we can't lose sight of where things are going. Uh, time, time passes very quickly. And so as supervisors, I think we are the orchestrating, we are the, we're orchestrating their success. Okay, subtly, gently, not directly. I can be direct sometimes. Um, <laughs> but I think knowing where they should be heading, where the, the, where the milestones, that should be big milestones, not the smaller milestones. We need to celebrate the more milestone. Emily is very good at that. Uh, so need to know the big milestones. What are the key crucial points that we should be checking? And then breaking that down into smaller steps, making sure that we're achieving those smaller steps because those are the smaller steps that lead to the big milestones. I think the motivation comes through celebrating those little steps and the, but making sure that everybody is on the same page with what are the big milestones we should be working towards. And Marilia? I love that, by the way. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Mar Marilia. I completely agree with uh, uh, Hongling, uh, but there, about the singular singularities again, so uh, I think we have stimulated the autonomy the, of our students, but there are someone that don't don't correspond this autonomy, this initiative, this uh, um, desire of researching and producing producing things, uh, uh, works, texts. So we have to push them all the time push them and sometimes it, it really doesn't work um i had a a, a, um, a candidate in, in phd she stopped several times she had lots of problems healthy problems uh she separated from her husband uh, she she lost she, she lost her job everything bad happens but at the i i went with her until the end and then i i start to ex, ex, ex exigate um oh, to, right. to cover yes. her oh. you have to finish that you cannot do that not to demand her you cannot do that with you not even with me i work a lot with you we have to finish so sometimes we we use all our uh, uh forces our strate strategies and sometimes we have exactly the opposite people who products all the time you have just to to guide i think this is the ideal work for a, a supervisor just guide people bring things bring research and we guide but it not happens like this we have some people who are student not researcher they get in for the job for the diploma and they need the same attention or more attention so we have to to adapt for each one but i think this kind of uh, uh, mediation 
or training for supervisors is important, mainly about the problem of racism and uh, political and social problems. We have to talk because there are people who doesn't uh, 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 pay attention for the way they treat the other. So this kind of uh, a professor, specialist, uh, uh, intellectual, it's not fashionable anymore. We are changing a paradigm, a paradigm, paradigm. Yes, paradigm. <laughs> we have to change. So we have to invert to uh, re rethink our structures. Mm. But we we can uh, help a little bit. Uh, th that's it. Hongling, doing some some course, some training. It it should it should have help. And yeah, it always sounds like uh, it's a language that we use and how we um, like there's no one solution that fits all. I think that's what we're understanding at the moment. Um, but it's almost like the language that we use. I, I like how Hong when you were saying like, you know, let's look at this together, um, almost um, giving even on, say, the first year of their candidature, giving that sort of um, shared perspective of, you know, you're not in this all and I'm not expecting you to do everything. Um, eventually, it sounds like we, you know, you sort of want to lead them into that direction and, um, and, uh, and get them to sort of lead some of the discussions. But even on the initial set go, um, getting them to be a bit more independent, responsible, it sounds like that's sort of the direction, right? Um, I guess, I don't know, Emily and Gabriella, um, you know, do you have anything quick <laughs> to share um, on, um, you know, perhaps some of the advice or some of the, the um, I guess, I, I want to say not instructions, but I hope you kind of understand where I'm going with when I say, you know, directions from the supervisor, you know, what's worked, what's not worked, perhaps. Um, I, I can try and I can try and answer based on what I think <laughs> you're referring to. Um, uh, mm, okay, maybe it, maybe I won't quite answer your question entirely. I hope this That's does right. make sense. But um, and maybe some PhD students will understand what I'm talking about here. But I try to think of my relationship with my supervisors as just another project for me to manage. And so I need to understand what's going on in my supervisor's lives so that I can use them to my benefit. Um, so I need to take into account what sort of um, what sort of workload they have at that time or, you know, is it a week where they're doing a lot of marking? Um, is it, you know, are they preparing for things? But I essentially need to know what they're experiencing so that I can use their time efficiently and it might mean that um, you know I, I um, send them really specific emails about you know what sort of feedback I need and I say this is the type of feedback that I want or um, I will set up I will actively set up meetings with them and confirm that the meeting is happening the day before um, just to make sure that they are making time for me um, I think it's okay for students to be to feel a little bit um what's the word like selfish you know it's your PhD and so if you need to sort of demand a bit of time from your supervisors that's acceptable um you need to do it in a professional and a polite way but by sort of encouraging these weekly meetings or monthly meetings or whatever it is and keeping on top of your supervisors I think that is a skill that a lot of PhD students are yet to learn. And that might be why they're falling behind on some of their supervising or supervision meetings. Um, but I think it's really also important to set appropriate goals. So um, Marilia, you mentioned that there was a student who was uh, really struggling, who was going through a lot of, of personal things that were impacting her PhD progress. And I think the tiniest amount of progress is better than no progress. So it might just be adjusting your goals so that you do maintain some, uh, 
progress despite everything else that's going on. And we had comments in the chat before about how much COVID was impacting our work. And absolutely. Like that, you just, you have to adjust though. So I think trying to be really proactive and managing up, so managing your supervisor um, is a really good skill to develop. But I'll leave it there. I, I sort of write yeah, anything. No, that was, that was really excellent. Good. Thanks, Emily. No, that was really good advice as well. And sort of touches on some of the questions that I saw. <laughs> I hope so. If I have, uh, I have two advices, one for the supervisors and one for the, the, the researchers, for the supervisors to be respectful. We we are not living anymore in a in a white European um, ma uh, uh, machistic world. Stop that! First of all, respect. Just respect the people is studying with you. And for the candidates, just don't don't pay so much attention for your supervisor. Do your research leave him uh, or her uh, besides ask uh, and take as emily said take what you can take what you can even if you take if you choose a very star professor then you will have more, less time so take take your part everything you can but don't pay too many attention for the personality of your your supervisor. No, that was really excellent advice, Marilia. And um, <laughs> yeah, oh, we are sort of running a little bit behind, but I don't know if Gabriella, if you were like really earning to say something or. No, I, I'm not the best person to give advice on keeping on track with your research, importantly. But I think it will think that I, I'd like to say to people is that we also have to respect our time and our moments because we stay for a long time in our, our doctorate, in our PhD program. And maybe we're not going to be as productive as, as the same way every time. We're going to have uh, a month that you're writing a lot and you're uh, reading a lot. But maybe you're going to stay, have a month that's not your month. We're just doing the bare minimum. And it's okay as long as you don't give up in the middle of the way. And always to rely on your fellow colleagues in PhD. I guess we find out as we have in this conversation that people go through the same as we are going through all the time. And this also helps us to keep motivated and to keep fighting for our goals. Yeah, and I, I sort of recall quite fondly with when I was doing my um, my PhD studies as well, where, you know, every every Friday we'll just have a couple of drinks, a bit of a rant session, <laughs> talking about what worked in experiments, what didn't work, and um, celebrating the little moments um, of, you know, when something did, like even just, oh my God, we actually submitted a paper and, you know, or even like, oh, we got, we got this revision done. Um, or, or even times where you just need to let it out, uh, that, that kind of conversation and um, I guess that non-judgmental uh, listening kind of, kind of sets a bit of that, um, the ground for, for trusting and uh, trusting each other and knowing that you can feel, you, you do feel like you're in a comfortable place to, to just talk, right? Um, yeah. But I think, I think we'll wrap it up there. We're a little bit behind time. Uh, but thank you so much to um, the panelists, so Emily, Gabriella Hongwei, and Marilia. Um, so, Julia, if we want to pop the slides back on. Thank you. Um, and, of course, uh, a big thank you to Samantha for uh, the presentation. I think it really helps uh, you know, get, get this kind of conversation going. And... Um, the, the meeting so uh you know for those who uh, flavia who reached out to uh, samantha um to to create the presentation um you know we've got like julia flavia um i think there was a host of us 
um, who reached out to these speakers um, and then get them on board. So thank you to that. Um, of course, Julia, you don't see at the moment, she, but she's in the behind the scenes um, helping me with all the tech stuff. Um, and of course, you, the audience, um, I hope you actually found this useful. Um, and if you do have any other burning questions, I know we couldn't get to everything, but I think this is quite a nice conversation to have. And um, hopefully it's something that we can uh, sort of explore um, a few more times as well. And um, and uh, I, I sort of wanted to touch on, I know, Marilia, you talked about how you have that um, that. Uh, uh, clinic open to academics if you wanted to maybe provide that information later on we can share it on our newsletters and on our website as well I think that will be um, amazing and the same for um, the uh, ANPG as well Gabriella if you want to do that um, too so just next up um, quick closing um, as I mentioned right at the start we've got a feedback survey so I, I don't know how fast you are with your phone to scan that QR code um, but it will be sent out in a uh, post event event bright email. Um, of course, you should definitely 100% become a member on our website. It's free. Um, it's the ren.global, um, and it's just a really easy way to um, get access to loads of great information, research, networking. On top of that, you can actually share your stories with us. Whether you've got a new publication, whether you've got um, like a really fascinating project. We just had a, a person write about her experience in Antarctica. Of course, it doesn't have to be that grand, but that was pretty cool. Um, or even just your journey in STEM. And we publish it on our website and on our newsletter. Uh, and of course, uh, if you, you know, if you want to connect with us even more, we've got social media. Um, we're all we're on all the accounts um, and it's just really easy to find us uh, the ran global um, so I'll leave it at that and thank you so much for for joining on hope you really found this uh, a useful um, conversation um, and won't be the last I believe thank you so much <laughs>